You may be seated. So tonight, we're going to do a, a, a book study, a Bible study, of the book of Ruth. I entitled my message tonight, Gleanings from Ruth. And uh, with your permission, I'll be kind of bouncing around in the story at least a little bit in, at the beginning of my message. Uh, of course, I think we're all familiar with the story. The story of Ruth is a delightful tale of a lovely woman who was chosen to be the great-grandmother of David and thus the founding matriarch of the family in Israel from which Messiah would come. It's a rendezvous of romance and redemption. So there you go. I skipped to the very end of the story and told you the end. Amen and good night. No, you're not getting off that easily. <laughs> As I say, I think we're familiar with the story, and uh, so I did choose to tell the beginning or excuse me, the end right at the beginning. Now, the events of the story took place during the time of the judges, we're told. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So there we have the setting. It's the time of the judges in Israel, and the story is going to occur in two places in Bethlehem of Judah, and in the country of Moab. And the story is occurring, therefore, sometime between 1400 and 1050 B.C. Now, a couple interesting tidbits. Tradition tells us that the place where the Church of the Nativity was built is also where Ruth and Boaz built their house. If you go to Bethlehem today, you'll find a very ornate church or somewhat ornate church, I guess I should say, with a very ornate place where they say that Jesus was born, that the manger was there. Don't know if it's true or not, but tradition also tells us that that's where Ruth and Boaz lived, and their house was there before the manger. Of course, well before, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years before. Thus, tradition says that the place where their greatest descendant, the Lord Jesus, was born is also the place where they started their family. Don't know if it's true or not, but it's a nice little story nonetheless. Tradition also states that the field of Boaz, where Ruth does her gleaning, was adjacent to the field that eventually becomes known as the field of the shepherds, the place where Jesus' birth was announced. So we see that Boaz and Ruth find love in the field right next to where God announces his greatest love of man, the gift of his son. Now, that tells us a little bit about Bethlehem, I suppose. Moab is east-southeast of Bethlehem on the opposite side of the Dead Sea. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen or been in the area around the Dead Sea. It's, it's stark. It's desert-like. It's mountainous. It's not an easy place to travel around. I don't know whether they would have traveled by foot to the Dead Sea and then sailed across. I don't know. Whether they had to go all the way up north and around back down south to get to Moab. It would not have been an easy journey. Um, and yet... We know from the story that they made that journey from Bethlehem to Moab and eventually Naomi and, and Ruth come back the same way. These trips would not have been made on a whim. Now the Moabites were descendants of Lot and his daughter. They were not believers, even though they were distant cousins of, of the Jews. And they worship a god named Chemosh. At least I think that's how it's pronounced. C-H-E-M-O-S-H. Chemosh. And they worshiped Chemosh through infant sacrifice. So it was not a place that godly people probably should have been. So 
This story is more than just a picture of domestic life in ancient Israel, more than a nice romantic story where they all live happily ever after, which essentially they do, but it also portrays for us our kinsman redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. It portrays his providence. It gives us examples of love and grace. So, indeed, this story allows us to glean some admirable character traits to emulate. So, on to Moab. As we know, the time of the judges was a time of turmoil in the history of Israel. And every man, and, and why? Well, because every man did what was right in his own eyes. It was anarchy. The era was often marked by God's chastisement of his people. And that chastisement came in different forms, usually war and raids, and often as a result, famine. So that's what we have here. Famine in the land. And then we're introduced to this family. Verse 2, and the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife, Naomi. The name of their two sons, Mahon and uh, Chilion. Uh, they're Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the city, or into the country of Moab, and continued there. And Elimelech's, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died also both of them and the woman was left of her sons and her husband so there was famine in the land and they chose to leave now most of the and probably in fact all the characters in this story their names have meaning I discovered the meaning of all but one Elimelech's name means my God is king my God is king Naomi, her name means pleasant one. And their children, Malon means sick. And Chilion means pining. So it makes me wonder that perhaps Malon and Chilion were, were born during the famine. You know, a time of or pestilence, a time of sickness, a time of pining for the good old days when the Lord was blessing. In any case, they made the long and difficult trek to, to Moab. We know that after a period of time, the, the boys married two Moabite girls. Ruth, whose name means friend, and a good friend Ruth is, we'll see, and Orpah, don't know the meaning of her name. Now the story is silent regarding why or how Elimech, Mahon, and Chilion died. Now, it's guesswork on my part for, for Elimelech. Remember, his name means um, God is my king. And yet he, a Jew, left the promised land in time of trouble and went to Moab. And in so doing, he exposed his sons and his wife and himself to that evil culture. And as a consequence, his sons did what they shouldn't have done and married foreign wives, further immersing themselves into that culture. So my personal supposition is that perhaps God took Elimelech home. Perhaps he sinned a sin unto death. We don't know. Don't quote me. Jewish tradition holds that Malon and Chilion died because of their taking pagan wives. Uh, in any case, uh, we might take a lesson um, about this. You know, if because there's no mention of returning to the promised land until these three tragedies occurred. Maybe they were content right where they were outside of the presence of God. Remember, the land of Judah was where, and Israel was the place where God was. They're in 
Moab where he is not. And yet they were seemingly content. Perhaps the sons would have never wanted to leave if they had, not, if they had lived. Perhaps it's a warning to us in regard to being careful what we expose our families to. Being careful about whom we befriend, whom we marry. You know, we're warned in the New Testament not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Mahon and Chilion were unequally yoked. Now, Naomi apparently had a good relationship with her daughters-in-law. If we continue the story, verse 6, Then she rose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So here her two daughters-in-law are saying, hey, you're leaving, we're going too. You're our family, we're your family, we love you, you love us, we want to go with you. They didn't say, oh, glad to be rid of that burden, let's go find a good husband. Nope, they, they stayed, they, at least at first, they wanted to come. And we see into Naomi's character a bit. She cares about these girls. And I think she was also testing their faith. Because I have no doubt that Naomi was a good witness to them, despite them being unfaithful and going out of the land. I think we can conclude that Naomi was faithful in witnessing and telling them, her daughters-in-law, about the true and living God. We know that because of Ruth's decision but she doesn't want to tear them from their families, doesn't want to tear them from their culture. And as I say, I think she was testing their faith as well. Verse 8, And Naomi said unto her two daughters, And lo, go return each into her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you. And as ye have dealt with the dead, that's my sons, and with me, the Lord, Jehovah, grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. In other words, go find yourselves, you're young, go find yourselves new husbands. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Verse 10, and they said unto her, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They still said, I want to come. And I think this was sincere, at least at first. Verse 11, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that you may, that they may be your husbands? Remember, it was Jewish law that a brother married his dead brother's widow and produced children for him, produced an heir for him. Naomi apparently was well past childbearing age, or at least past being interested in getting married again. I'm not going to produce any more sons, and even, even if I did, you're going to wait until they're marriable age? Go home. Turn again, my daughters, go your way. Verse 12, for I am too old to have a husband. If you should ha say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons. Would you tarry for them after they're grown? Would you stay uh, for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Well, thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord, the Lord, Jehovah, the true and living God, the Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So 
So here's Naomi. She hears the famine has left the land. She determines to go home to Bethlehem. She's virtually destitute, without husband, without children, without grandchildren to protect and help her. As I surmise, she was past childbearing age and kindly tells her daughters-in-law to remain in Moab. And we can assume that they both had professed love for her and love for her God. We see Orpah decides to stay and we can draw some warnings from her life. First, it's possible to act like a Christian and not be a Christian, not be converted. We don't have any reason to believe that Orpah was a conscious hypocrite, that she was just you know, playing along because she could have easily left after her husband died. But she stayed and wanted to continue to go with, with Ruth until finally she was dissuaded. She was, you know, Jesus talked about the seed that, that, that goes into hard earth and, and sprouts and then dies off because it didn't root. I think that's Orpah, or Orpah would be an example. Because saving faith perseveres even in hardship. Orpah realized this is going to be a long, hard trip back to Bethlehem and what awaits us. She doesn't have any money. Doesn't have any means of, of producing any wealth. No means of getting me a husband. And she decided, well, you know what? I don't really want to leave my comfort zone. I don't really believe in that God of hers. I'll go back to Chemosh. Ruth, however, took a step of faith. Her choice was, first of all, full and unlimited. She says, your God is my God. Your people are my people. I go where you go. Our God wants that kind of devotion from us, I think. Secondly, we see that her choice was affectionate and loving. Thirdly, I can, I can almost picture her and see in her face and hear in her voice her determination. Don't you even try to stop me. I am coming with you. And that's the end of the story. Naomi certainly saw that. And lastly, her choice was final. She said that I will not turn back from the Lord, nor will I turn back from you. I'm going to die with you. That's what will part us. You know, as we continue to read through the story, we can see some desirable traits from Naomi as well. You know, although she and Elimelech didn't always act in faith, she never abandoned her faith. She did persevere. She did return to the promised land. She was a faithful witness. Let's continue reading. So the two went on went until they came to Bethlehem and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and they said is this Naomi? They were excited and, and, and amazed after all she had been gone for a long time they were pleased to see her remember what, what was her what's her name mean? It means pleasant one people liked Naomi and she said unto them call me not Naomi call me Mara bitter. For the Almighty, that's El Shaddai, hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. By the way, skipping back to verse 6. Well, yes, yeah, skipping back to verse 6, we see um, something else here that I forgot to mention. Verse 6. And then she arose with her daughters-in-law that they might return from the country of Moab. Why? For she heard in the country 
of Moab how the Lord had visited her people in giving them bread. You know, God is always faithful. Even when he's punishing his people, God is always faithful. God visited his people. He had mercy. He gave bread. You know, if we're suffering, and if we're suffering because of our sinfulness, God will use that to bring us to repentance. But he will have mercy. If we're suffering because it's part of God's plan and not because of our sinfulness, we can count it as glory and still know that God is always faithful. So although she had become bitter about her circumstances, Naomi, she was also a loving and compassionate person and a witness who engendered love and loyalty. Look at verse 20 and 21 again. So Naomi returned in Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. She recognizes, actually I skipped, um, didn't read the verse I wanted. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. You know, Naomi recognizes that God's in charge, that God's in control, that God in his providence allowed these things to happen and that he was permitted to do so. He's sovereign. And as we continue in the story, we're going to see that once back in the promised land, she offered Ruth wise and godly counsel. We need to develop friends who can give us wise and godly counsel. In chapter 2, we're introduced to Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Through him, we can see parallels to our Lord, his descendant. <clears throat> and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So first of all, he's described as a man of great wealth. Well, our Lord owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's described as a mighty man, and his, and his name means strength is in him. Well, Naomi refers to God as almighty. And in fact, Jesus is almighty. Boaz, as we'll see in the, as we go through the story, goes beyond the call of duty throughout the story. being far kinder than he ever needed to be. Well, if Boaz went beyond the call of duty, Jesus gave his very life for us. Boaz is the very picture of generosity, as I mentioned, of kindness. Boaz is a good employer. Boaz, Boaz shows grace. Boaz shows honor and mercy. Well, as we continue in the story, and I'm not going to read it all to, to you tonight, but we see that Ruth is, continues to be loyal. She goes with Naomi. She remains with Naomi. Now remember, when they got to Bethlehem, it was, we were told that the barley harvest had started. She knows that they have no food, and she apparently had learned that there's a custom called gleaning. Well, what is gleaning? It meant that it was part of God's law, in fact, that when the owner of a field had the reapers go forth to reap, that if they happened to drop anything or as they cut the grain, if it flew off in a, in a different direction, that they were just to let it stay, not pick it up, not pick up every single piece of grain and make sure that they had it all so that they could get the biggest profit. No, they were to leave it so that the poor could come and gather food. Now, Ruth might have said, well, 
boy, I followed her all this way, and now I've got to go do a job I've never done before, and it looks like it's going to be awfully hard work. I'm out. Nope. She knew their need and offered to glean. You know, Ruth proves her love by her actions. Ruth proves her faith in God by her actions. That's what James says for us to do, right? Faith without works is dead. Don't speak of love. Show it. Also in the case of Boaz, we can see her love for Boaz and for God by seeing what Ruth didn't do. You know, true love disregards pride. Disregards pride. I, I already told you, Ruth could have said, you know what, I'm out. Your kinsman's rich. Why should I go glean? This is hard work. You go, you go uh, talk with Boaz and tell him what's what. He needs to support us. There wasn't any of that with Ruth. She did what she needed to do. Look at verse 6. Actually, it's not verse 6, but um, we're told in the story that she happened upon a field and she asked permission to glean. Now, remember, gleaning was a right, but she showed another admirable character trait. She showed humility. She asked permission to glean, even though it was her right. Again, she shows her faithfulness in leaving home and now working for Naomi. And thirdly, uh, we see through the testimony of, of Boaz's servant, she was a hard worker. Pick it up in verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you, blessing them. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Apparently he was a good boss. They liked him. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? I've never seen her before. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And here it is. She asked permission. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now uh, that she tarried a little in the house. A little in the house. Now, reaping was done, started in the very early morning. You don't want to be reaping like noon to two or so because the sun's strong and hot. It's a desert land. So here she's working basically constantly. Now there was apparently a tent out there for the workers to, to rest and get some refreshment and go back in. Reading between the lines, yeah, Ruth did rest when she had to, but she was working a lot harder than any of the other gleaners and perhaps harder than the reapers themselves. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not glean... Go not to glean in another field, neither from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go, there, go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go in unto the vessels, and drink of that which is the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldst take knowledge of me, seeing I am, I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed to me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come into a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord, the true and living God, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. 
And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat behind, beside the reapers, and he reached his parched corn, re, reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even, and beat out uh, she gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley, about a bushel. Quite a lot for gleaning. So we can see several things here. First of all, we see that Boaz did indeed do far beyond what he needed to do. All he needed to do was let her glean. He let her rest. He let her drink of the water. He fed her. And then made sure that she got extra to glean. And we noticed in verse 3 that she thought she just happened to go to the to this field where she met all this kindness and just happened to find the field that was this near relative of Naomi. Coincidence? I think not. It's the providence of God. God is always in control. God was directing the affairs of Naomi and of Ruth and of Boaz and those about, her, about them as well. God is always directing in our lives as well. So we see Ruth's reward. Why are you showing me such favor as a foreign woman? Well, Boaz explains and informs her that um, he had seen and heard about her faithfulness, her love, her kindness, her conversion. And he says, well, you know, I, I'm helping you out here, but it's God who's going to give you a full reward. You're under his wings. You're under his protection. So are we. We're under his wings. We're under his protection. And guess what? God is watching and God is seeing our good works. And he will be faithful to reward them. He'll be faithful to lay up treasures for us in heaven if we are pleasing him. Look at verse 18. We see providence revealed. So she took up her barley and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave her that which she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be uh, he that did take knowledge of thee. And then she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be, the, of the, be he of the Lord, who hath not left of his kindness to the living and to the dead. No longer bitter, acknowledging God's kindness again. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Boabitess said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And by that he meant not only the barley harvest, but the wheat harvest, which would end two months later. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maintenance of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So Naomi, surprised by the amount Ruth gleaned and said, where in the world did you get all this grain? And when she hears, she admits and reveals God's faithfulness. And of course, we serve the same God. He's still faithful. 
And Ruth tells her, you've received godly counsel. Listen to what Boaz has told you. Stay with his young maidens and don't go anywhere else to glean. So he, she reemphasizes those godly instructions. In chapter 3, we see Ruth's redemption being assured. So after these months, Naomi decides, you know what? The time is right to take this relationship to the next step. You know, Boaz and Naomi are, are, are becoming more and more acquainted. So we pick it up in verse chapter 3, verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? In other words, shall I not find you a husband? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, but make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be the one he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And he said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she came, she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drinken, and and his heart was merry, he went down to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself and behold there was a woman laying at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Verse 10, And and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed me more kindness in the latter end and at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. And we'll pick up the story in a bit. So we see that Naomi feels responsible to Ruth to find her a husband. So a plan is made, Ruth obeys, is given precise instructions, and obeys precisely. Now, later in history, Hosea warns that the threshing floor was often a place of immorality. You know, we see here that Boaz's heart was merry, it says. So this was a place where there were moral liaisons often going on. And we see by his reaction. What's going on? Who's here? He was a man of virtue as well and, and was worried perhaps for his reputation. Who's this woman lying at my feet? But in this case, nothing improper, nothing untoward occurs. Ruth lies down and rests at the feet of, a re- of her Redeemer. Are we not to rest at the foot of the cross? Doesn't scripture tell us to be still and know that I am God? That we're to wait upon the Lord? Ruth is a good example for us. We see in verse 9 that Ruth asks Boaz to fulfill his duty. Marry me for the purpose of preserving Malon's name and property and provide him an heir. But again, Boaz goes beyond that. He says, I know you're a virtuous woman. He's basically saying, you're the right woman for me. I love you, and I'm not only going to perform my duty, I love you. As Ruth had fallen in love with him. Chapter 3, verse 11, Ruth is a, as I said, vir- Ruth is a virtuous woman. Perhaps the writer of Proverbs in describing the virtuous woman was thinking at least in part of Ruth. And how does Boaz show his love? How does Boaz show that he's going to indeed 
take care of Ruth and Naomi? Give an heir to Malon? Well, he pours out six ephahs. He says, where's, where's your veil? Hold it out. Now, the veil was big. It was like a sheet that she was wearing about her. Pours out six bushels. Imagine she must have struggled under that load. And sends her on her way. Symbolizing that the changed state of Naomi and Ruth. And also symbolizing, perhaps, Ruth's future fruitfulness. So in Boaz, again, we find that he's a good man, an upright man, a good employer, a kind and thoughtful benefactor. And if we look carefully at Scripture, we find one other thing about him. We know that he's now the ancestor of David, who is therefore he's the ancestor of Jesus Christ. But do you know whose, an- whose ancestor, who was the ancestor of Boaz? Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot was his either mother or grandmother. Thus, Jesus, in his family tree, has both a Moabite and a Canaanite as ancestors. Outside blood was chosen to form the chosen family. The family from which David would come. And of course from David comes Jesus. It's a foregleam that Messiah was to be for all nations. Of which we should be glad because I don't think there's one Jew among us. Jesus, though a Jew in his ancestry, had Canaan, Canaanite and Moabite ancestors. So on the story goes, in chapter 4, we see that Boaz goes to the city gate, where the place of business is. He brings ten witnesses with him. Because this is an important occasion. And we're introduced to, the, to a closer relative. He says, I, you know, I'll, I'll gladly perform this for you, but there's someone who's actually got the right to do this. Boaz is a man of honor. Even though he was in love with Ruth, he says, there's another one who actually has the honor. So he goes and he calls this meeting, he calls this man who the writer doesn't even bother to identify. As we'll see, there's probably a reason for that. The writer of Ruth probably didn't want to honor this man. Because this closer relative is a greedy closer relative. So Boaz starts the negotiations and says well, you know that Malon died and, and somewhere along the line apparently Naomi had sold the field that belonged to Elimelech and should have belonged to Malon. Well, remember, real estate transactions in Israel were not forever. And there was a means of gaining that land back and that that means was through a kinsman who would redeem it who would buy it back we're bought with a price our redeemer Lord Jesus has bought us the land could be bought back well this seemed like a pretty good idea to, to this unknown closer relative yeah I'll do it I'll buy the land he says oh Boaz says oh no 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 not so fast You not only have to buy the land, but you need to raise up an heir for Malon. Wait, 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 what are you talking about? No, I already have a son. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, blur the lines here and maybe, maybe my son loses his hair. No, I'm out. I'm done. I'll let you do it, Boaz. I'll make that sacrifice. And so we get the strange, we have, we've seen a number of strange things here, uncovering the feet, covering with the skirt, as it were, and now a, a third strange tradition. Okay, we'll seal the deal. 
I'm going to take off my shoe and give it to you. All right. Done deal. Ruth's mine. So Boaz carries out his duty, but has also fallen in love. And what's the result? Well, I already told you the end of the story. They have a baby. And that baby, Obed, begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David. So we've gleaned a number of things here from our story of Ruth. We've seen some admirable character traits that we can emulate. We've seen <clears throat> that God is faithful, that God rewards us. We've seen that God's sovereignty. And we've seen that God has a plan in history. Not only for Ruth, not only for Boaz, but for each of us. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day that you've given it. Again, a day of rest and gladness. Father, we thank thee that you are indeed in control in heaven. You're not the God of, of that someone would have you be in heaven, stroking your beard, rocking and going, Oh my, what's my creation doing now? No, you are the sovereign God. You are in charge of history, even when bad things happen. We see through the story, we can safely trust in you. And if we're faithful, that you have a plan for us to bring forth your continuing story and your continuing glory. Help us to be faithful as you are, as Ruth was. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't pick anything. <laughs> let's um, let's sim, uh, stand and sing, please. Hymn 493. We'll sing the first and last verses. Glory to his name. Hymn 493.